Richard Terrell and Larry McDonough. Um, Richard is uh, not only a jazz musician, but a poet and a uh, has taught uh, English in, in college. And Larry is not only a musician and a composer and arranger, but also a lawyer. So they've uh, multifaceted and we're delighted to have you back. I will, um, I will, I think, spotlight Larry's, Larry's image, unless um, Richard is speaking and I'll switch it back and forth. So, all right, take it away. Thank you. Oh, you're first. Okay. Yeah. First one, I, I, I tagged Actually, yeah, thanks for inviting us. I think it's cool. Like, I haven't, Larry would probably have the exact number. I think it's cool, like six times, six or seven times at least. We are group and we're always proud of this. Um, our uh, description said that we were going to talk about the sources for uh, our writing, my poems, Larry's composition. And the last line I put on was something like, uh, and we'll try to draw some parallels from spiritual pursuit. Is pretty hard to do, <laughs> but it occurred to me. We've done this service before a number of times, but it occurred to me just a couple of days ago um, that really the, the poetry writing and the composing that is the spirit, <laughs> it's not a matter of apparel. I don't know why, <laughs> I don't know. something that popped into my head in the middle of the night after we've had a one day. Um, so, the making of art, I think, by its very nature, nature is spiritual. And then I thought, well, why is that true? And I came up with four ways that that uh, might be true. First of all, the process of creation is all consuming. You can't write a poem while you're thinking about you know, your shopping list. Um, uh, you, have to, you have to be in the moment, which is something we all strive for, is living now rather than in the past. And if you're making something, if I'm playing a solo, I can't be thinking about what I'm going to do later, uh, for instance. The second thing is that I think um, the creative process, composing something, forces you to pay attention to the outside world. So you're not just living in your own uh, bubble. And that might be a rhythm section that I'm listening to when I'm playing uh, with the quartet, or if I'm you know, observing the natural world, observing people and using that in my, in my writing. And the third way that I think it's a spiritual pursuit is that we have the outer and then the inner because uh, creation forces you, I think, to be true to yourself, your inner nature. I don't think you can make art, uh, good art that is consistent, that is not consistent with the values of experience, which doesn't mean, you know, that you can't write about terrible people in your fiction writer. Of course you can do that, but you have to look within and tell things out. And the fourth way is that when you're um, creating something, it forces you to make choices make choices and um, yes these are are aesthetic choices primarily but I think there's sometimes a moral or ethical dimension to it. having to do sometimes with the content of the work in writing for instance but even in music that can sometimes be true do I, do I choose to when I'm improvising play something that's discordant and meant to shock or disturb the listener or do I choose to play something that's soothing and dark many or bring out that emotion. So I think these choices beyond being aesthetic have interests that might consider spiritual. Okay, so to move on then to poetry specifically, I'll probably read about three poems. First one I'm going to talk a little more. I think that um, writing poems, there are, are two sources um, for probably all poems. One is the imagination, and the other is the music of the language. So that the way that Poem sounds actually tells you what to write, and that's more true than you might expect. But we're, we're driven by sound, just as we are with music. Steve Bellington said, "If it sounds good, it is." I think that's true for poetry as well. Um, and then I break break it down further. And one source, well, one source is for poetry that we may, may not get to because we want to play some music. Is is observation? You just go out and look at the world and write down what you see. Uh, in, a, in a subjective manner, 
And, and that could be uh, one source for a poem. Another place poems come from is experience, personal experience or the experience of someone else. But the poem is not nonfiction. It's not journalism. It's not autobiography. You almost always elaborate, make things up, fictionalize. It's perfectly uh, you know, allowed in poetry. So the poem I'm gonna read, if I can bring it up here. Uh, what I've done, there we go. Let me get rid of this. Okay, this time I'm not gonna talk to myself while I'm doing this. Okay. Um, what I've done is uh, I put in red everything that's made up and the black is the part that's true, the thing that really happened to me. The other thing I'll point out before I read it is that this first part is called a prose poem and it's written in paragraphs rather than in lines and stanzas. And when I was thinking about this, working on this, it seemed to me that it, it had to be prose because the rhythms were fairly loose. You know, it's not like this. Um, so, uh, but when I finished that, it seemed, see what you think when we get to it, the last time it seemed a little too, you know, uh, closed off. It seemed a little too, uh, uh, you know, editorial. So I added a section that I think is much more emotionally nuanced. Um, and that I decided to put in, in lines. And in fact, it even rhymes. So there's a contrast between the prose poem and the end of the poem. Okay, so here it is. Security question, what was the make of your first vehicle? When I was 24, my father insisted it was time I finally owned a car, owned a car. He gave me his sky blue Ford LTD, the car my mother had driven to work to be greeted each morning by a young colleague who hailed, look, here she comes in the Queen Mary. Now, nine years of miles under its frayed belts, its old hoses were spilling their essence on expressways miles from home, leaving me at the mercy of small town mechanics with big dreams. With a traveling job, it was time I owned a used car I'd bought myself. I car shopped with dad who knew the ropes and we ended up at a dealer, an uncle of a man my father knew slightly at work. And there it was, a Ford LTD, the next year's model from the one he'd given me, or maybe the year after that. Different color, executive tan, but the same white vinyl top. They'd had changed the chrome, Dad pointed out. The next day, I drove home by myself in a used Toyota Corolla, forest green, five on the floor. Its engine hummed like a happy aircraft. I drove it past the years until I saw road beneath the floorboard and then more. But the day I drove it off the lot to my father's home now, my father said nothing. No Jap jokes, no less car, more money, no worry about the scant availability of parts. That was wisdom, perhaps love. So how should this poem end? With the paragraph preceding, or with another leading down another road, the world changed again in color, size, and pace. And I am that man standing old, bemused, unminded in the driveway, without sons or their complications to temper my regret, my dismay at watching all the different models race to their different newer destinations. <laughs> Okay, so I'm up now. I'm going to talk a little bit about the creative process in composing music. Um, I want to share my screen for a moment. I want to tell you a little bit about the first piece that we played. So let's go over to that. So we played a piece called Tuscarora that I wrote. And if you can see the music there, you can see that um, it starts off with kind of a, what I would call linear melody moving up. And um, I drew upon the piece blue and green, which has kind of a linear line moving down. And the other thing I, blew, I, I drew draw from blue and green is 
when you get to the end of the chart here, it just takes you right back to the beginning. It's what I call kind of a circular composition style where if you came into the tune halfway, you wouldn't really know where the start was. And that's kind of what I tried to do with Tuscarora too. This line at the very end leads right back up to the beginning again. And so the reason why there's a, some common elements between these two pieces is that I was thinking of blue and green when I wrote Tuscarora. Tuscarora is my favorite lake in the Boundary Waters. And my thought was to envision Bill Evans. Now this chart says Miles Davis wrote it, but anyone who's really studied this realizes that Bill Evans wrote it and Miles later in life, you know, acknowledged that. It was common for band leaders to take credit for compositions of their bandmates. But I, I, my thought process was imagining Bill Evans on Lake Tuscarora in the Boundary Waters and what music might have come through his head. And what came through my head was something of a parallel to Blue and Green. So next up, we're gonna uh, play a piece called The Rose for Two. Uh, we've played this for you in person before. And uh, I've talked about my daughter, Rosie. And I think Rosie might have come once or twice to services. So Rosie now, to make those of you that have known me a while feel old, is 28. So she's my youngest daughter, has special needs. She travels the world like a preschooler, um, which makes her very interesting and cute. She's kind of like a knucklehead, but um, very vulnerable. She'd get in a car with anybody. So she always has to be under a watchful eye. And uh, uh, a friend of mine was developing a program that allowed um, kids with special needs to compose by simply tapping on the screen on a color, and the color would be assigned to a note. And so some of the kids, I think, were kind of intentional, and others, like Rosie, I think, were kind of random. And so what Rosie produced was what I call the A section of this piece. It starts in the first line and goes to the second line. And I'll start the piece by playing you just the melody. It took me a while to figure out what to do with this melody, because it's not complicated, but it moves around so effortlessly in the scale patterns of music that it, the chords needed to modulate to stay up with it. And then the B section here, which starts on the third line and goes through the fourth line was written by two kids, Jennifer and Patrick, the kids of the designer of the software. So my task was to take these melodies that are kind of disparate and write pieces based on them. And it took me a while and you know, you'll, you'll see what it sounds like when we play it, but it, it's a very kind of haunting and interesting piece. So now I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to change my view over here so you can see us both and we will start playing.
did everything right. Uh, the next poem I'm going to read <clears throat> is about that most spiritual of jazz musicians, John Coltrane. And uh, the source I'm considering for this is uh, research, the way you'd research a nonfiction book. And that can be uh, sometimes just taking the language uh, from another source. T.S. Eliot famously said that amateur poets borrow, professional poets steal. So you just take other people's language and reassemble it and make it your own. Or it can be you know, the facts of something, whether it's someone's life or something you learned about birds. Uh, and you, like, you, you take an, uh, an excerpt from that, a small piece maybe, and work it into a poem. So in this one, I have, uh, oh, I should say too, that these are all from my last book uh, from about a year ago, What Falls Away is Always Poems and Conversations from Holy Cow Press in Duluth. Uh, so in this one, uh, let's see. And read uh, the beginning of the poem, which is everything that I got from research. A lot of it from a, a recent documentary about Coltrane, which was on Netflix, I think, until not long ago. And some of it things that I knew from reading biographies and album uh, liner notes and so on. And then at the end of the poem, towards the end, I sort of loose my imagination on, on his life and imagine what, what it might have been like if he'd lived to be 80 or 90 instead of dying uh, young as he did. Coltrane, he liked to laugh, didn't smile on album covers only because his teeth were bad. Once there were so many waiting in line, he took tickets at his own gig so the doorman could catch a break to pee. He was shy, and if you weren't, he just agreed with you. Journalists came away writing about themselves. He said, sometimes I wish I could walk up to my music as if I had never heard it before. He asked, did you like it? Did you really think I played well? Imagine him among the galaxies like light bending gently through time. Einstein knew about that early, but kept it to himself. Or imagine him earthbound, breathing the very air you later would. Then see him instead, almost 90, tending his garden, hoeing red potatoes sweet as kept promises, dragging his rusted implements, lacquer worn away to essential beauty, gently over the loose soil, which is also sweet to the small animals living there who, who, and who can hear him hum in the cord's upper structure. See him maybe leave the yard still too soon, as if it didn't matter, as if all the world weren't there. So the next piece we're going to play is a piece that I wrote for my Aunt Mary Lou, and I've, I've played it for you in person before. It's called Tango para Maria Luisa. And um, she and I were very close. She was, I'm from a very, very small family. Uh, my dad uh, was a single child, an orphan. Uh, my mom had one sister and um, she had five kids. So I have five cousins total and one aunt and uncle. Um, one cousin has passed and so have my parents and my aunt and, my aunt and uncle. So Mary Lou, uh, was the other professional pianist in the family. She went to music school and she stayed at home and raised the five kids and taught piano. And I was such a, a nerd at, at such an early age, maybe all nerds are themselves at an early age. Um, when the other kids would be out playing, I would sit in the parlor and eavesdrop on her giving piano lessons. Uh, so she and I became very close. And when she was declining and she knew her time was short, she asked if I would play at her funeral. And I said, be my honor. And I, I just assumed I was going to uh, play a classical piece because she was more, as us jazzers like to say, a legit player. Uh, that's kind of an old music school thing that because the classical players often did not think highly of us jazz players, even though we were classically trained as well. Uh, we referred to them sarcastically as the legit players as if they were the only ones that were legitimate. So anyway, so Aunt Mary Lou was a legit player. And um, but as I was driving back through northern Iowa, the last time I saw her, 
thinking about what I might play, this tango started coming into my head, which was quite odd. Uh, I usually compose at the piano and noodle around and come up with something. And uh, this sounded pretty good. And so I, it, it seemed pretty strange. It was a tango in nine instead of in four. Um, so I wrote it down because uh, I was worried I was going to forget it when I got home. I turned off the radio and hummed it and played it and, and wrote it. And when I got home, I wrote it and played it out on the piano. And, and it, it's pretty much as it is, which is also kind of unusual. Usually I have drafts of tunes, not just uh, tunes that appear. So anyway, so this is us playing Tango para Maria Luisa.
already in here. Um, the next poem I'd like to read, we're going to try to do uh, that musical accompaniment with it. Um, and uh, the, th the third, or I guess this is the fourth uh, source I've talked about, ob observation, uh, experience, and research or borrowing from another text. This also borrows from another text, uh, but it's what I call a premise poem, uh, a what if poem. And this poem uh, posits what if uh, in the scene in the, in the Christmas song, The Little Drummer Boy, what if the animals had a say in it? And there's lots of animals. Uh, it's a barn, you know. So um, there's been this line in the, in the, the song um, that I always wondered about, and that is, uh, it says, the ox and lamb kept time. And I always wondered, the ox and lamb kept time, you know, what did they need the drummer boy for? He's really extraneous. The animals had it down. They had it together. So, um, so I used that premise, and this one actually came pretty easily. I'm sure I did some fine tuning. But um, in fact, there's one line down here that I, I, a year later, I fixed it. So sometimes, you know, it's not a very glamorous process. There's a lot of revision involved. So, uh, okay, so we're gonna try this. I'll be going back and forth here. So here's my premise poem. Um, the ox and lamb kept time, little drummer boy. And so it came to pass in those days that the animals were mute. Their cloven hooves caked hard in mud and waste could thump a hollow sound at the city. They never rushed, never dragged. It's the steady progress of your feet. It was only human that the animals' minders and tenders but they themselves played the rhythm of their pipes in the field. Drum of the child was the The humans in those times and now saw themselves as the best Can I, I'm, I'm sorry, can I interrupt you for a second? The audio, Richard, your audio is not coming through very good at all. So I'm not sure. Something, um, so something about the mixing. We're hearing Larry's piano just fine, I think. Okay. Okay. Have to read it. Wait, I do. Thanks for interrupting. Yeah. Okay. We'll make a quick change here and we'll have Richard come over to my computer and then he can read it. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. I'll we'll be good. Hold on a second as we do Zoom shenanigans. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I should. I... Oh, wait. Uh, let's see. I got to go first. I have to start doing this. You want to be right over here and do it? Uh, You'd have to talk into that microphone. Yeah. Okay. But it, yeah. Oh. Oh no. Why don't you put on the headset? Then we're going to do the thing. Just about ready for you guys. Okay. How is that? Is that good? Okay. You. That, that's good. No, I can't be in two places at once, so you can't see the whole poem, but it's, <laughs> it's not a hard poem. To pull yeah. Up. All right, let's take two. The ox and lamb kept time, little drummer boy. And so it came to pass in those days that the animals were musical. Their cloven hooves caked hard in mud and waste could thump a hollow sound at a steady pace on the barn floor, muted in straw. They never rushed, never dragged against the steady progress of their beat, which was music to the heavens. It was only human that the animals, minders and tenders, shepherds, stable boys, 
thought they themselves played the principal instruments, whether pipes in the field or the drum of a child in a song taken to be true. For the humans in those times as now saw themselves at the celestial center, a kingdom that rules the kingdom of beasts. Wise men with gifts, angels on harps and strings, may or may not have been present in the scene, depending on your level of belief. But the lambs and the oxen, they are unquestionable, beyond symbol, beyond faith. It was a barn, we know they were there keeping time steady, inalterable, out of reach of human hands that shaped and misshaped the very planet to which all children are born, holy or not, on that night or any other. The carols are wrong. It is the flocks that kept watch by night, who by instinct maybe felt a pulse we cannot feel, and by their presence tell us we are not the masters. So what I can just tell you a little bit while Richard gets reorganized here, uh, the arrangement there. Uh, little Drummer Boy, it, it's kind of interesting to play it without drums, so uh, you have to kind of imagine the drumming going on, which is kind of fun. And also, um, I, I changed the harmonic structure a little bit. It's got a fairly stagnant structure to it, which is part of what emphasizes the drumming because the harmonies don't move around much. And so, again, I, I tend to put a Bill Evans kind of face on a lot of things. and so. I kind of imagined how he might have rearranged the tune and, and that's how I came up with it. And I think Dick is ready to go, so I will shut up. So I do have time for one more poem and then we'll do one more quick tune. And uh, and then maybe have time for your questions or reactions if that's what you do. So I do have time for a, 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 to illustrate um, a poem that depends solely on observation uh, along with the music of the language. So it's, um, it's from a series called Three Poems in Winter. And this one is uh, Out the Library Window. Today, the December sun casts the shadows of two benches, two park benches set at near right angle over the unbroken white of new snow. A line of pure snow mounds the seat of each bench, and a smaller line rhymes on top of the back. The shadows distort the squared shapes of the sturdy benches, one shadow skewed to a trapezoid as if in Magritte, the other foreshortened to a solid block of blue on snow. There are not yet tracks from the sidewalk 20 feet away to the spot where someone could sit 
on one bench and look past its twin to the lake through a thick stand of black spruce, dire green against the sunlight and the cold sky. No dog has turned circles of play in the white. No foolish rabbit has left its series of quotation marks. No beech or oak leaf has left its world to land there. What comment to make on this unbroken field, untrammeled, almost unimagined, except as I see it from the library window and then return my head down to my digital burden. So, you know, that great feeling when you get a new snow and there's no footprints on it, it's just great. If you're from the upper Midwest, the one little trick I pointed out, I always tell, used to tell my students is, you can describe something by saying what's not there, right? No dog has turned circles in the white, no foolish rabbit, you know? So by, by saying what's not there, you're saying what is there? You know, it occurred to me that we're, we're being a little technical with you in some of this, but what you can maybe take away from it is that both of these pursuits are labors of love, which is as spiritual as, as you can get. And we have time for one more too. And what uh, Dick's mentioning is also a, a pretty common, what maybe not so much these days, but it was a, a really nice technique in writing lyrics. I mean, some of my favorite lyrics are written kind of in the negative, like my romance. It's, it's, it's all the things that our romance isn't, is essentially the, the lyrical print of the tune that reinforces what the romance actually is. And, and, and a lot of lyrics, like you must believe in spring, it talks, it's, that's not in the negative, but it talks about, it's, it's just a bunch of analogies about what is, what is the, the, the transition from winter to spring, what is it in other forms? And so I think those are the parts of both literary writing, but also writing lyrics that makes, makes them memorable is because they're phrased that way. So the last piece we're going to do is a piece called All of You. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about my arranging of it. I'm going to talk about what Bill Evans did with this tune. And so uh, what jazz musicians often play out of is a thing called a fake book. And a fake book can be really kind of old and ratty. As is mine. The cover is all worn off. I, these were illegal fake books back when originally made. And so I got mine when I was in high school in 1970. And it has tunes like this one, all of you in it. And what the reason why I want to show you this is that Bill Evans plays this tune, all of you, but he rearranged it in a way that I think he could have taken, given it his own name. So this is the original chart and the melody goes, ba da da ba da da ba do ba da Boo da da da, boo do, ba da, ba da ba da da da, do do. So that's, uh, and so what Bill did with it is he started playing around with the harmonies. So the harmonies are different here, and he came up with a different melody that that will play here. And there's uh, Dick wrote a poem about this piece one time and said there's there's not much that you can do to connect the tunes. And so what Bill did, I think he played around with this tune so much, it became a different tune. But because he was such a deferential guy and the root of this tune was Cole Porter, he kept the name together and, and attributed it to Cole Porter. I really think of it as a Bill Evans composition. Um, I'll play the Bill melody on the way in, and then Dick will improvise a little bit. I'll improvise a little bit. And then Dick will play the Cole Porter melody on the way out. And I think you'll see how, how different they are.
So one other thing I'll say about Bill's arranging style on that piece is, um, again, if you if you look at these, I just want to pull this up again because I'm such a nerd about what he did with this piece. So I'll just I'll just do this quick. So if you're getting bored, just take a deep breath, go to the bathroom for a moment. So um, again, this is the melody that you've got. It's it's just a lot of long tones. Really, it's it's like dotted quarter quarter ba ba da ba da like that. And uh, Bill's melody is a little bit of that at the beginning, but look how angular it gets when he gets down to bar 10. It's almost like he's improvising a solo there rather than it actually being a melody. And then when you get to the end of the tune, let's see if I can slide down to the end of the tune here or not. I'm having a little trouble finding where that is on my computer. When you, oh, there it is. So when you get down to the end of the tune, he has this little tag on it. And he did this often. A, a lot of jazz players, I think, when they're phoning the gig in, they don't do anything interesting with the ending. They, they just end the tune or they end it the same way that you've heard it many times. And what um, Bill often did, is he did two things here. He did what we call a tag, where you take, you start on bar 30 here, and you do, and then when you get down to 34, you keep repeating that. And it allows somebody to improvise over it. In this setting, I improvised over it. But when you get to the very last line there, he, he kind of created these three bars here that really have nothing to do with the tune, the structure of the tune. And I think it's to get your attention, to kind of say, we're about done here, but I'm just not going to end this in some sort of standard stock way. I'm going to do some modulations here. I'm going to take you on a little side trip, even if it's only for three bars. So... Uh, he did that so often in his compositions and arrangements, and I think it's one of the reasons I find his compositional style so interesting. End of blather. Excellent. Thank you, guys. I enjoyed it very much. Um, let me see here. I have a final reading. Um, as a benediction, 
And then what I think we'll do is we'll just go to our coffee hour. Now I just lost it. Um, hang on a second. We'll go to our coffee time, and anybody who wants to hang out and, and discuss or talk about whatever we can, and you guys are welcome to join us for that. i got to find my memories. There we are. Okay. So there's this poem by... Howard Thurman, and it was cre credited on here as being called The Mood of Christmas, but somebody commented that it's called The Work of Christmas, so I'm not sure which way it goes. But it's by Howard Thurman, and this may be just an excerpt, I don't know. Uh, it goes like this. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people, to make music in the heart. And so we thank you guys for making music in our heart today. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, so uh, y'all are invited, everyone's invited to um, stay on board and join in a coffee hour chat um, and uh, being mindful that um, we are still in the Christmas weekend, so many of you might have things to um, go to or uh, host or whatever, and also some of you might be a little tired this morning <laughs> so um so thank, thanks thanks uh, richard and larry I appreciate that um i'll put up uh in the chat uh, a link to uh richard's website and mine so if you're interested in in the books from which richard was reading uh, we played music from several several of our cds um, and i'll i'll put that up in a moment yeah great I, I recommend both of those. Uh, we've got a couple, several CDs and a couple of books, I, at least a couple of books, I think, from Richard at our house. Um, one thing that came to mind for me um, that kind of touched on both the structure of poems as as Richard described it but also um, the memory that Larry talked about his aunt um, my mom played piano um, and my dad loved music and my dad was kind of a smart aleck sometimes and uh, my mom tried to teach me to play piano and I was resistant but one time I asked my dad if he wanted to hear me play the new song that I had learned from the John Thompson first grade book or whatever it is. And um, he said something like, can you play Polonaise? And I, I didn't know what that was. And I, <laughs> I said, no. And, he's, and he just kind of, look, let me know when you learn that one or something like that. And <laughs> that gave me an idea of taking that the facts, as Richard talked about it, the fact of the story, um, I don't think he's meant to be mean, but he's like, I don't want to hear some six-year-old kid playing the piano, you know. Um, but uh, gave me an idea, at least for a title, for a, for a poem. When you learn pol Polonaise, call me, I think I call it. <laughs> you know, so... Anyway, well, well, it's it's a challenge to be a parent of a kid who's learning music, um, especially if you really have a deep love of music, because you're you're kind of the unfortunate witness to the learning process. <laughs> right. um, and it's um, you know m my dad, uh, I, I had kind of a tough childhood. My dad was abusive, and um, that's a whole nother story. And but you know. He really wanted me to play the trumpet. I was playing clarinet at the time, and he, and he wanted me to play the trumpet because it was two on a brass. And and so 
you know, he made me switch a trumpet. And, uh, but then he didn't like how it sounded when I was playing it. So I always practiced when he was around in the basement behind the furnace um, so that nobody would hear me. It also allowed me to practice the clarinet, which he had forbid me to play because I still liked it. So that was kind of my little space. But when you, you know, I, I think whenever you're in the middle of a creative process of others, it it can be kind of a little uninteresting. Uh, and, you know, if you were there to just watch Richard go through drafts of a poem, um, that might not be that interesting either until you actually see the final product. Yeah, so, right. But, you know, when you're a parent of a kid who's doing music, you're kind of stuck with it. And so you have to kind of transport yourself to a different place and, and hopefully marvel at the improvement and as opposed to what the product is. Right, yes, indeed. Good morning. I'm, um, thank you so much, Holly, for inviting me. Uh, the music and the poems, uh, it just felt it was uh, very spiritual. And uh, when you're in the creative process, uh, I'll address this to Chuck. Perhaps your father didn't have that spiritual creativity, and so he couldn't understand or he didn't like when you um, played, and same with Larry. But for parents who are musicians or have that uh, creativity, even, I mean, whatever, if it's a, if you're a poet or if you're a musician, I think you see that beauty that is um, waiting to unfold and blossom. So you have to, you know, have the ear to hear that the creative process is in the making. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, as a parent of two kids who went through um, learning band instruments uh, from sixth grade on, um, I was always, I always marveled at the difference between the seventh grade band concert in the in the fall and the seventh grade band concert in the spring it's like whoa <laughs> That's, you know i it was a little hard to hard to uh, listen to in some in some spots in the in the fall concert but the spring it's like wow they've come come a long way <laughs> and god bless middle school band teachers i'll say that yeah, I, I'm a former band director, and the middle school teachers have the toughest job. The elementary school teachers, the kids put them on a pedestal. So then when they see their junior high or a middle school teacher, it's like everything wrong about them. And then when they get to high school, the high school band director, which I was, had an amazing carrot to deploy, which was the band trip. Yeah. You practice, you show up, you go on the band trip. If you don't, you don't. Yeah. And, and so the middle school teacher doesn't really have that. But you make a good point about, you know, you can, and maybe Dick, you might want to say something about this, the difference between like practicing your instrument by yourself and rehearsing with other people. And even taking private lessons, you're, you're learning how to improve on your instrument, but you're really not learning how to integrate that improvement with anybody else. And it's really the being in band that kind of brings that single voice and teaches people how to merge it with a community voice. Yeah. I don't know, Dick, if you want to say anything about playing the saxophone in the bathroom in, in, in your basement or not. <laughs> well, I think you just said it. Yeah, that's my studio is a basement bathroom because I like the acoustics. <laughs> what you're saying, it's sort of like, you know, being a monk or being, you know, a... Uh, I don't know, a community pastor or something. And they're both, they're both needed, but maybe you have to do the monkish stuff in order to interact with people. So, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to draw some spiritual parallels, um, but it's, it's sure a lot more fun to play with other people uh, first than, than to practice, for me anyway. Uh, other people, other musicians feel differently. Bill Evans famously didn't like to perform. He, he liked to practice. Mm -hmm. Greatest jazz pianist ever. Uh, but uh, and then there's the next level is there's you know playing with other people in a rehearsal and then there's performance and for me 
performance was always necessary. I guess I still need that carrot and stick. Like the band trip, the band trip for me is when we have a gig, you know, so then I work harder. <laughs> yeah. Well, bless all you um, uh, music teachers. My, my son loved marching band, jazz band, his private lessons. I don't know if you guys know, knew John Clegg. Um, he was a great sex teacher. And um, so bless you all. Dick, you've probably told the story before, but do you want to tell them about your saxophone, your tenor, where you got it? I, you know, you don't have to do what I suggest. You can go, yeah, no. It's my, the horn I'm playing, it belonged to Bruce Peck's father. I mean, I think some of, I think a lot of you know that story maybe. And uh, that I, when I played for you, when you played for you a few years ago, Bruce said, well, I brought this horn that, you know, I, you, you said you wanted to try. And I had no memory of saying that because it had been a year. <laughs> been, you'd been at your church, you know? So I said, okay, I'll try it afterward. And, uh, so after we finished, I played like three notes on it, and I thought, "Oh my God, this is just wonderful." And I've I've missed I've missed this. It's like I'd never eaten steak before or something, you know. And, and suddenly, uh, after forty five years, uh, there it was. And uh, and so yeah, he sold it to me. And uh, uh, well, that's the short part of the story. I wrote a whole essay about it. It'll be in my next book coming out next. <laughs> you just set me up for a plug, Larry. It's coming out next September. <laughs> Holy Cow Press, and the, the, one of the first essays in the book is called The Horn, and it recounts that experience, so. Nice. Uh, Dick is passing me money as we speak, you know, for doing, doing that <laughs> plug. Well, you know, I was just talking to someone recently about one of the really cool things about music, and, 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 and I think congregations and, and book clubs and things like that, is the people that you meet that you would not have met otherwise. Like, I met Dick through music, and uh, there, uh, there was a um, entertainer, entertainment reviewer at in the Mankato paper, and I was playing a show down there, and um, he and I were talking, and I said, "Yeah, you know, the sax player I'm working with is kind of busy right now, but I, I really like doing these duos of sax players." He said, "Well, you should meet Dick Terrell," and so then Dick and I talked on the phone, and we we enjoyed the same kind of music. We got together and played, and now we've been playing together for 20 years, and. And um, it, it's and so the saxophone that Dick plays now is just kind of a chance conversation with a member of your congregation uh, who's since passed. And every time he plays that horn, uh, not maybe not every time, but a lot of times he plays that horn. I think of Bruce, and um, you know that would not have happened had we not played at your at your church. And so. It's amazing little kind of random little journey that we go on and, and music because you can collaborate with so many different people. Uh, a chance collaboration can lead to a long, a long partnership. It's really fun. Yeah. 